Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, wow. It's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty good for six o'clock on a Sunday night. Uh, I was telling the elders earlier, I, uh, my, my preaching body clock is a little all over the place. Uh, as, as an RUF minister, I'm normally preaching to college students um, in my backyard at about 8, 30, 9 o'clock on Tuesday nights. And then I swung over to here to preach at 9.30 in the morning, and now I'm here again at 5.30 in the evening, and my body clock is just kind of all over the place as to um, what, I'm, what I'm doing. We're continuing um, looking at the book of Ephesians and considering this great story that God is writing, and we're um, going to consider something tonight about our place in that story uh, we kind of zoomed out a little bit in the first chapter this morning and looked at kind of God's grand story, uh, the kind of narrative of the universe. And now we're going to kind of zoom in a little bit just on our place in this story, how we fit in to it. So uh, we're going to read verses, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. 2, 1 through 10, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works." so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's go to him in prayer. Gracious God, we come to you and we are, uh, we are humbled um, before your word, before Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2, so, so much rich truth, so many beautiful things in these passages, and so little time for us to consider them. Lord, we pray that this time would be fruitful, that you would send your spirit, that you would come yourself. We confess our faith that the teacher is here and he's calling for us. Lord, would you come and would you teach us? Would you open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears? Let us love you, let us see you, let us hear you tonight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Uh, as I mentioned this morning, I work with college students at the University of South Florida, and uh, part of my, my job is kind of meeting with, with students and, and discussing kind of what's going on in their lives. And in general, um, one of the major obstacles or things that I end up in conversation about is kind of roommate issues roommate drama, roommate issues. There's just some fun facts for you. Um, a, a trend that I've noticed is guy roommates um, tend to be people that kind of coexist together in the same space. Uh, you can see guy roommates are two, they just pass two ships passing in the night. They happen to sleep in the same space, but very rarely does their relationship go much beyond the fact that they live in that same space. Girl roommates, it's the exact opposite. Girl roommates are kind of one of two extremes. It's either best friends, like, oh my gosh, where have you been my whole life? Our children's children are gonna know each other. We're gonna vacation at the same place every single year. We're gonna know each other. We're gonna talk on the phone. We're gonna do everything together. We're gonna be inseparable or just worst enemies. I mean, just absolute worst enemies. It just tends to be the case that that's how it works out. Um, another kind of dichotomy that exists is uh, it tends to be, at least I've noticed this, that there tends to be uh, kind of two types of people when you move into a new space. There tends to be neat people and there tends to be messy people. You know, there tends to be the neat roommate and the messy roommate. I, I myself, I must admit, am the messy roommate. 
Um, you can ask my wife. I'm still the messy roommate. Uh, you know, how many, you could just nod at me, but how many of you were the messy roommate? You know, when you were around, you're still the messy, a couple of you. Yeah, yeah, a couple of you, the messy roommates. And here's the interesting thing about messy people, though, uh, is messy people never actually think that their mess is all that gross. That's why they're messy. Because, you know, they see their, their clothes piled up everywhere. They see some dirty dishes. They see some kind of trash and things that should be picked up. But they know where it is. And they're kind of like, oh, I'll get to that at some point. It doesn't bother them that much. But here's the thing about messy people you got to know. Is messy people were total hypocrites. You're total hypocrites. I'm a hypocrite. We're total hypocrites when we come in. Because here's the thing. Messy people, you'll go into somebody else's house that's messy. And you'll walk in and you'll be like, man, you nasty. Like, this is gross in here. Like, y'all have never seen a vacuum? Like, the laundry room is right over there. Why are your clothes right here? When are you going to do the dishes? For some reason, it just happens to be the case that our own mess does not bother us nearly as much as other people's mess. We're very objective when it comes to other people's mess. We have a very good perspective. We come in and we're like, this is disgusting. You need to pick this up. But then in our own place, we're like, it's not so bad. It's not a big deal. Like, settle down, I'll get to it. It's coming around. For some reason, our own mess is just not that big of a deal for us. And here's what Paul wants to do, is tonight, Paul is gonna get in our business a little bit. Paul, he wants to walk into our room metaphorically, and he's gonna look around and he's gonna point out some of our mess. Because here's the thing about you and me, we're pretty good about getting used to our mess and our messiness and our disorder. We kind of look at it and go, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And what Paul wants to do tonight is he's going to just walk us right into our room and say, I don't think you quite realize how messy this is. I'm not sure you quite realize how bad it's gotten. And so what Paul wants to do for us tonight is he just wants to look at two, two very simple things. God's perspective on us and what God has done about it. God's perspective on us and what God has done about it. So first we're going to look at God's perspective on us. Verses 1 through 3 is where we'll mostly be sitting for this. Um, and so in verse 1 it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked and you were dead. Here's the thing. Are you ready? This is the first step. This is the first thing you've got to do. If you want to become a Christian, if you want to live the Christian life, if you're thinking about this, if you walked in here tonight and you're like, I don't even know why I'm here, but I did, somebody, my relatives, I'm in for the 4th of July and they made me come here. I didn't want to come, but I, I, they made me come. Here's the first step about becoming a Christian is you've got to realize this, you're dead. Here's what Paul says. Here's, here's what Paul doesn't say. Paul does not say, you need to try a little bit harder. Paul does not say, you know, if you don't nip those things in the bud, it's going to get bad. Paul doesn't say, you need to join the uh, spiritual gym and, and drop a couple pounds. Paul doesn't say, you need to change your spiritual diet and just do a little bit better and work a little bit harder and just be a little bit better version of you. No, no, no. What Paul says, he comes right in and he says, you are dead. You know, there's a great TV show I love, and uh, this will not land for any of you, but I'll say it because it makes me laugh, uh, where he, there's a doctor who lists a bunch of symptoms, and then at the end he writes the word death, and he says, in case you missed that class in medical school, that one's untreatable. Thank you for the three people that laughed at that. I really appreciate you playing along. It's very nice. That one is something that's untreatable. This is, the key, this is the key to becoming a Christian. This is the key if you're going to live the Christian life. This is the central thing you've got to start from is you're dead. Apart from Christ, you are dead. You need to know the right diagnosis for the disease that you have. Because if you get the wrong diagnosis, you will take the wrong medication. If you come in and think, I'm not so bad, I just need to clean up. Maybe if I just brought a new suit. Maybe if I just dropped a couple pounds, maybe if I just read a Bible, my Bible a little bit more, maybe if I just did a little more serving in church, maybe if I just served a little bit more in the community, maybe if I just stopped watching that TV show as much, maybe if I just cut back on this habit a little bit, cut back on that, trim a little bit here, trim a little bit there, maybe then everything would be okay. And Paul wants to stop you and say, no, 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 friend, it's much worse than you think. You're dead. And here's the thing, you might be here and you might be thinking, man, that's pretty harsh. That sounds pretty difficult. But imagine this, imagine if you went to a doctor 
and you were complaining of some sort of pain, and it, and it came back that you had cancer. Uh, but the doctor came in and said, hey, congratulations, you're, it's all good. You're all set. Don't worry about it. It's nothing. Don't bother with it. You might leave that doctor's appointment feeling better. You might be like, oh, well, that's a relief. Isn't that good? But that doctor would not have loved you and served you well. That would not be what you actually needed to hear. What you needed to hear is, no, what is happening is very serious. Here's the things we've got to do. Here's what we need. Here's the steps we need to take. Here's what needs to happen because your very life is in danger. And yes, you might leave that place distraught, but you would leave knowing the truth. And in this case, the truth is the difference between life and death. And what Paul wants to do is he wants to come in and he wants to say, friends, you are dead and you do not just need a get, a get well soon card, a little bit of help, a little bit of nudge towards more spirituality, a little bit of help getting over the edge. No, what you need if you're dead is resurrection. What you need is new life. What you need is a whole new life. What you need is to be called out of the grave. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. That is God's perspective on us. We're dead. What, is, what does it look like to be dead in our trespasses and sins? We'll look at verse 2. Following the course of the prince of the following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of of the air. Here's the thing you need to know. In this grand story that God is writing, you and I are not neutral actors. You and I are not neutral characters on the sidelines. No, no, no. We're following the course of this world, the prince of the power of darkness. That is who we are outside of Christ. We are all, in our own varied ways, in our own unique ways, there are as many ways that we do this as there are people in this room, trying to take away the authorship from God, trying to make ourselves the main character of this story, trying to bring our focus onto ourselves, and trying to live however we want to live, in whatever way we want to live, following the course of this world. And some of us do it by having our power and dominating other people and making sure that nobody else is going to question our authority. Nobody's going to tell us what to do because we're going to be unique and we're going to do it our own way. And others of us, this is maybe more my personality, we do it by being unique, by being sweet and loving and kind. We want everybody to love us. And so nobody ever tells us anything bad because we're just so sweet and wonderful. We're just really kind and we're really gentle because we want everybody to think that we're really great. No matter what we're doing, no matter how we're doing it, we're trying to steal that main character role away from Jesus and put it on ourselves. We're following the course of this world. We're doing exactly what the angel of darkness did, which is he took. He thought, I'll be like God. I can take his praise. I can be like him. I can be the main character of my story. I can have my own way. I can do it my own way. I can be the one who decides what's best for me. And that's what we're all doing. Here's the interesting thing. If you've ever heard, have you ever heard this, that um, Christianity is easy? That's for other people who can't deal with the issues of life. Christianity is simple. That's for, the, that's for those people who want to avoid the difficulties, right? Here's the thing. Here's what Paul says. You're following the course of the power of this world. Here's what Paul is saying. He's saying that if you're going to become a Christian, if you're going to live into God's story, you're going to be swimming upstream a lot. Here's the interesting thing about becoming Christian. If you're here and you're thinking, you know, my life out there is really, really hard and difficult, and so I'm going to come into the church, and so that way everything will become easy for me, I've got bad news for you. It ain't going to work out like that. I'm just, I'm sorry to tell you, if that's what you're hoping Christianity will do for you, that you'll come into the church and things will get easier, that almost never happens. When God leads his people out of Egypt and they're going to the promised land, he says, no, you got to turn and you got to head south, away from the destination that you're going. And you're thinking, what? I thought I was joining on to go to the promised land. And now we're heading in the opposite direction. But that is exactly the way it is in this kingdom. When you're going to live in this kingdom, when you're going to live this way, 
That means you're going to be swimming upstream. You're going to be swimming against some things. All of a sudden, there's going to be a lot of tension in your life because you're going to have these desires and these things and a world that's telling you how to live and that if you just go along and get along, it'll be easier. And then you're going to have Jesus and faith and the scriptures calling you to live a life of truth and righteousness. And those things are going to be intention and it's going to be really hard. Hear me, you should do it. It's totally worth it. But just let me just be upfront with you. If you're coming here and you're thinking this is going to be way easier, you might need to find something else. Because this isn't going to be easy. This is going to be really, really difficult because you and I are following the course of the pattern of this world. You and I are ingrained into a path. We are we are going with the flow. I don't know if you've ever been on a busy sidewalk and you've tried to walk against the grain of everyone else and it's nearly impossible. But it's really easy to go with the flow. It's really easy just to get behind people and kind of let the crowd move you along. If you're going to follow Jesus, if you're going to live in God's story, we can't follow the course of the power of the world anymore. We're going to have to unlearn a lot of habits where it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be hard work of uprooting many, many things that have taken root in our hearts. It's going to be difficult and hard work. So we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and we were following the course of this world. But good news, it gets worse. Verse 3, we were by nature children of wrath. Verse 3, by nature children of wrath. Friends, God doesn't take sin lightly. God does not take sin lightly. Can I tell you, some of you have experienced unspeakable tragedy at the hands of other people. God does not look at those things and shrug and say, yeah, stuff happens. It's too bad. Friends, God does not look at those things and think, eh, stuff happens. It's, it, you know, I don't know what to say. No, no, no. God looks at those things, those terrible things that we do to one another, those terrible things that have been done to you, and he's angry about them. If you have suffered terribly, hear this. God sees that suffering, and he is not indifferent to it. He is not indifferent to it. He is going to come and he is going to judge. And one day, everyone will stand before the judge of all the earth. And he does not take sin lightly, friends. Here's the, here's the thing. I think sometimes we think the opposite of love is anger. The opposite of love is not anger. The opposite of love is indifference. That if you see someone hurting someone you love. The opposite of love is not for you to get angry. That is an appropriate response for you to be angry, to say, no, this isn't right. No, this must stop. No, this isn't, shouldn't be. The opposite of love is indifference, to look at that and go, well, you know, that's just how things are. Friends, God does not look at our sufferings. God does not look at the terrible things that have been done to you with indifference and shrug. But here's, here's where this gets difficult. What about when it's you? What about when it's you who's done the wrong thing? What about when it's you who's done the bad thing? I mean, I hear, here's what I want to just ask you for a second. Have you ever done something just to hurt someone? I have. You know... We can, crowd, we can kind of dress it up in righteousness. They deserved it. I was acting in righteousness. I was standing up for truth. But really deep down, you know you weren't doing any of that. Really deep down, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could say all the right moral things. I could dress it up in moral language. But deep down in my heart, the only thing I wanted was for that person to suffer. The only thing I wanted was for that person to feel pain. Friends, God does not take sin lightly. And it is a sign of our fallenness that we think he ought to. Yeah, 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 but it wasn't a big deal. 
it's a big deal to God. What we do to one another, the way we harm one another, the way we treat one another, friends, that's a big deal to God. We're by nature children of wrath. There are some seeds that are growing up inside of you that are really, really dark. There are some things that are taking root in your heart that are very, very dark. And friends, those things have got to be killed. Those things have got to be destroyed because letting them grow, they're not just little things, but they are things that are growing up that will destroy you and destroy other people. Here's, maybe you're here, like I said, maybe somebody dragged you here and you're like, sin, that's just kind of a weird, you know, old timey concept. Um, I don't, you know, who cares what this book says? You know, like, let me, let me just push you this way and just see if this matches up with your experience a little bit. Um, suppose there's one place where Jesus says that by the measure which you judge, it will be judged to you. So suppose for a moment that we, um, we, there's an invisible tape recorder around your neck. And at the end of your life, you stand before God and he says, yes, yes, I understand. You don't want to be judged by any sort of arbitrary standard. You know, you don't want to be judged by anything that you didn't believe in. I understand. That's totally fine. Here's what we'll do. We'll take the tape recorder off your neck and all the other things that you said other people should do, all the complaints you have about other people, all the ways that you judged other people, that's how we'll judge you. How you doing? <laughs> We're by nature children of wrath because we don't even live up to the, our own standard that we have for other people. And we're just like the rest. In verse 3, Paul says, we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Have you ever thought that Christians are arrogant and proud people? If you've ever thought that, you've probably never met one. Because, friends, if you actually understand this, if you can look in yourself and see the seeds that are growing up and see the way that you treat other people and see that you were just like everybody else, this should make you incredibly humble, incredibly approachable, incredibly sympathetic, incredibly welcoming to other people. This is not a place where we come in and look down on other people because we know that if it were not for God, we'd be doing the exact same things. This is not a place where we come in and we look and say, oh, there's all, the, all those idiots out there. What are they doing? They don't really get it. No, 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 this is a place where we come in and say, oh my goodness, if, if it were not for God, if God had not moved in my life, if God had not come in, I would be doing the exact same thing. I would be living the exact same life. Friends, let us, let us be a people who are humble and gentle and welcoming of others. Let us be a place where we're not shocked by other people's sinfulness. There's a great um, illustration. I don't know where I heard it, but uh, there's a, a man who's fallen into a hole and a priest comes by and he says, priest, you know, could you, father, could you help me out? And the priest writes out a prayer and throws it down in the hole. And then another man comes by and he says, hey, brother, could you, could you give me a hand here? I'm kind of stuck in this hole. And the man says, yeah, sure. Throws a rope down in the hole, walks away. And then a friend comes along. He says, hey, Jim, I'm in this hole. Can you help me out? And then Jim jumps in the hole and he says, what are you doing? Now we're both stuck down here. And Jim says, yeah, but I've been down here before. I know the way out. Friends, can we be that type of people? Could we be the type of people that don't look over and say, yeah, 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 here's a rope. Pull yourself up. We'll be over here when you're ready. But could we be the type of people that when we see sin, when we see darkness, that we stand against it, but also we recognize that, man, if, if it weren't for God, we'd be doing the exact same thing. Can we be the type of people that jump down into those situations with people and say, I see how your sin is killing you. I see how it's hurting you. I see how it's destroying you. Let me help. Let me come and let me help you. Can I also just... Say this, if you're here, no sin is going to surprise us. Maybe you're here tonight, and I mean, this is just hitting you, and you're like, man, I, I got to talk to somebody. Can I just promise you, um, no sin is going to surprise us. I'm making a promise on your behalf, Daniel. Uh, no sin is going to surprise us. Here's the great thing. We knew what type of person you were before you got here. Here's some good news. You ready? You're not special. Isn't that great? 
Your sin isn't any different than anybody else's sin. You may think, I'm the only one who struggles with this. I'm the only one who's like this. Everybody else is holy and righteous except for me. No, it's not true, friends. You aren't special. And it's so beautiful that you aren't. That God's grace is the same grace he gives to us, is the same grace he gives to you. Friends, we're not going to be shocked that you're sinful. When you come talk to one of the elders, come talk to Pastor Dan, come talk to somebody, come talk to a friend and say, hey, I haven't talked to anybody about this before, but I, I need to talk to somebody. Come talk to them. First Church, I just made a promise on your behalf. Please don't be shocked when somebody comes to you this week. Please don't be shocked when somebody comes to you with some, with some stuff that's messing up their life. Let's not be shocked. Let's not start ranking sins and saying, well, here's the sins that we're really comfortable that God's grace can work on. But these sins over here, those are nasty. We shouldn't have any of those sins. God's grace couldn't do anything with those. No, no, no. Let's be people who say, yeah, sin is sin. It's killing you. It's awful. But God is rich in mercy. Let's jump down in the hole with people because we know that we would just be doing the exact same thing. So we were by nature children of wrath, dead in our trespasses and sins, following the course of this air, following the course of this world, just like the rest. Verse 4, but God. But God was rich in mercy. But God. But God, friends, why we should have been dealt with according to our sin, why we should have, why we were by nature children of wrath, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. But God intervened on our behalf. But God was not content for us to stay where we were. But God was not content to leave the world as it was. God was not content to watch us destroy one another. But God was rich in mercy. Friends, God is rich in mercy to you. Can I tell you something that you need to hear? Here's, I know I just spent a while beating you up. I understand. It's beating me up too. Can, can I just tell you something? Christianity is not about you coming up with new and creative ways to hate yourself. Can I just tell you that? Like, I think one of the things that we mistake holiness for, for self-deprecation, friends, Christianity is not just about you hating yourself all the time. No, that is just another way that we try to make ourselves the center of this story. Christianity is not about you at all, amen? Christianity is about, yes, I was dead. Yes, I was by nature a child of wrath. Yes, I was following the course of this world. Yes, I was destroying relationships around me. Yes, I was ruining everything, but God came in. But it was Jesus but he stepped in and now he's the center. And now if you're in Christ, your story is not about your sin. Your story is not about the ways that you've harmed people. Your story is not about that, but it is about God and Jesus and what he has done for you. Dear friends, would you believe that? Would you know that all of your sins, past, present, and future, everything is forgiven in Christ and you can now live fully for him? That Christianity is not just about navel-gazing, Christianity is about a totally new orientation. Or yes, we see that we're dead, but also that we see we can be made alive again in Christ. Friends, this is God's plan. This is what he's up to. This is what he's about. There's a great theologian who says we ought to consider Easter a verb. That God is in the business of Eastering, that what God is up to in the world, the thing that God does, the thing that he's all about is about taking death and bringing life. That he's all about that, that he's all about taking broken and sinful and messed up people who are dead in their trespasses and sins and bringing life and welcoming them into a new kingdom and bringing them into his presence and empowering them with his spirit. Friends, this is this God who is rich in mercy. This is this God who loves us. This is this God who is for us. That praise God, he doesn't deal to, with us according to how we ought to in our nature, but he deals with us out of his great love for us. But God, being rich in mercy, God is overflowing with mercy. There is, no more, there is no sin that you can have that would overwhelm the grace of God. There is no more. He has so much mercy. 
He has too much mercy. He's throwing it out. It's overflowing. He's overflowing with mercy to you. Friends, it is this God who is calling you, who is inviting you. This is the center of your story. Let this be the truth that is so true about you. Yes, I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but God was rich in mercy. Let that be true of you. Come and find your home in him. Come and find him. He is gentle and lowly of heart. Come and find your rest in this Jesus. How do you do it? Very briefly, how do you do it? Verses 8 and 9, I love this. Paul says, for by grace you've been saved. I love this. Paul says it twice because he knows that you and I are, are so prone to putting ourselves back at the center of the story. He knows that you and I are so good at saying, yeah, 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 I know by grace I get in, but how, what do I got to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do I, how do I work this out? What do I, what do I need to do? And yes, friends, there are ways that you can grow in your faith, but here's the thing. Paul wants to shout at you, but God was rich in mercy and by grace you have been saved. It is totally a gift. There's nothing you need to do, but just come and receive it as a gift. I loved how we sang amazing grace. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. There's a great quote by St. Augustine and he says this. He says, to desire grace is the beginning of grace. To desire grace is the beginning of grace. Meaning, if you're here and you're like, man, I don't know if this is true, but I really hope so. To desire grace is the beginning of grace. A little bit of hoping that God might just love you is actually God's grace to you. Friends, see that he is gracious and merciful, that he loves you and he cares for you, even though you will we're walking in trespasses and sins. Even though we were far from God, he loves you and he's for you. Friends, receive that today. Let it seal, let it sit down deep into your heart. Let it transform you. Let it be true for you. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you do not deal with us according to our sins, but that you love us, that you overwhelm us with your mercy, that you care for us in such a way that you were not content to leave us in our sins, but you came, you came to rescue us, to bring us into your family, to love us. Father, would that be, would that truth be new again for us today? Would it ignite in us a great passion for you? And would it ignite in us a great peace and rest in your presence, knowing that there is nothing we can do that could separate us from the love of Christ? Might we come boldly to you, knowing that you love us and you care for us as we sing together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.